up on, you remember from last week that there was the sum of what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. And it was that there's a new covenant and that that new covenant implies that there was an old covenant and that that old covenant was passing away or fading. And specifically it said in the last verse, verse 13 of chapter eight, ready to vanish away. But then it spoke of the new covenant, which was actually quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, that God is going to put a new, do a new work and place the law of God into the minds and into the heart of the people. And that this new covenant would coincide with that, that the Gentiles have received, that basically it's all about the fact that we're saved by grace. We're saved because it's a gift of God. It's something that God has given to us. And as a result of us having received this gift, that really the only command that we have is to love one another and to love God as, of course, he loved us. And so it was very simplified. And it's something that you and I have entered into if we have trusted Jesus Christ's work at the cross, his salvation offered to us by grace as a gift through faith, not of works, lest any of us should boast. So that's a very um, important scripture that should probably have committed to memory. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he's saying to the Hebrews that the old covenant, which was the fact that God would be their God and would lead them into the promised land, that that was fading because the way that they would worship was through the Ten Commandments. This was how they would offer their worship unto God by not worshiping false idols, by not having idols in addition to God, by not taking the Lord's name in vain, which isn't just cussing, which isn't just profaning the name, but it would be to blaspheme the very aspects of his name, which are true. So Jehovah Jireh, he's our provider, that if we don't trust that he's providing for us, that we're really profaning or blaspheming his name. And that's what the Jews would, that's the position they would be in. And so they had the Ten Commandments, and those, of course, were the first three. But as we go through the, the list, we see that this was an opportunity for them to worship God. But that was fading. Why? Because they couldn't do it. They, they just, they couldn't keep it. And there was a fault. It's not that the command was with fault. It's that the people were with fault. So he says, I've got a new commandment. And this is the sum of it. So today, having talked about what that new commandment was last week. We're going to get into a little bit of the details of what the tabernacle was about and what the old commandment and old covenant related to. And so for some of you, this may be kind of foreign. We're going to talk about the tabernacle, which takes us all the way back into the book of, of Exodus and, <coughs> excuse me, and also into um, Leviticus and so on. We will not turn to those passages. But the point is, is that that's the foundation of that covenant. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, if you've been in the midweek study or if you've been following along through Zoom to those Exodus studies, then you're up to speed. You're already there. You have an understanding of what this is about. But we'll touch on some of these things. So in verse 1, it says, Then verily, the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So, again, to reiterate the idea that there's a worldly sanctuary that's been given, that's been established from Moses or by God unto Moses, unto the children of Israel. Moses was up on the mount, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, as it's also called. And he received the pattern or the instructions for how to build or replicate in this world, what he saw for the reality in heaven. So he was actually there in the place that entered into where the throne of God was. 
and he entered into that place where God is seated. And in that place, we see that replicated in the tabernacle, which was a tent, which was 15 feet wide, not really that big, 15 feet wide. By 30 feet deep was the first area, the holy place. And then you had the holy of holies, which was a 15 by 15 area with a ceiling all along the way, 15 feet. So not that big. This room is bigger than that tabernacle. And yet the priests would go in and minister into the holy place regularly, daily. And the holy of holies, the high priest would go into once a year or one day a year. He would go in twice, but he would go in one day out of the year on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, which is in the fall. So it says, truly or verily, the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service <clears throat> and a worldly sanctuary. And uh, for us to remember that this is just a, this is the pattern. In fact, going back to the previous chapter, the, the example and shadow of heavenly things according to the pattern shown to Moses in the mount. So um, verse 2 goes on, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So again, you have this area which is set aside for the sacrifices and uh, the offerings that would occur because people had sinned. And as we get to the end of this chapter, we uh, see that, you know, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So there's this issue of sin that needs to be reconciled. That goes all the way back to Adam and Eve after they had sinned and were expelled from the garden. You remember, they tried to cover themselves with the fig leaves, which was a work of their own. But then later on, we read that they were then given skins, which implies that there was an animal sacrifice that had taken place in order for them to have a covering and that was the establishment of all sacrifices we see that uh, Cain and Abel they had a point where they were supposed to offer sacrifices before we even get to the book of Exodus the Cain and Abel were offering sacrifices we see most uh, I'm sorry uh, Noah offering sacrifices we see Abraham offering sacrifices being told to take his own son Isaac to Mount Moriah and a three-day journey away to Mount Moriah and to offer his own son there on that mount. And then when he was ready to plunge the knife into Isaac, that at that point the Lord called out to Abraham and said, No, don't do this. I will provide myself a sacrifice. And we see the prophecy of him providing himself Jesus Christ, him being provided on behalf of all humanity, the sacrifice. But that took place on the same mountain. It's the same place, Mount Moriah. Same location where Golgotha is, where Calvary is, which is the place of the skull, which we believe was actually hewn out. It was outside of the city gates and hewn out in order to... Um, get some of the, the rock and, and so on that was in there during Solomon's time. Not to make the temple, but probably Solomon's house. The point being, of course, that that was hewn out. And in the work of that, that if you looked at it a certain way, and the shadows and the sun was creating the shadows, it actually looked like a skull. But up on the top of that mountain, that's Mount Moriah outside of the city gate, same place where Abraham was and received a prophecy with regard to the Messiah. So the point being, of course, is that offerings and sacrifice were already established. They were already known about before we even came to the point in Exodus and the building of the tabernacle. And so you had these offerings and sacrifices that took place, but the central part of the ministry that would occur unto God would be the fact that 
It says that there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein, in other words, the first part of the tabernacle you would walk into, which was that 15 by 30 feet long, 30 foot long area. And that was the holy place. And in the holy place, so you would walk in from the east, going toward the west, which is, well, it doesn't matter. I don't even know if, where east and west is. But you would walk in, and to your right, or to the north, you would have a table, and on that table would be the showbread, which every Sabbath, the priests would come and replace that showbread with new showbread. But it indicated that God is the, the bread of life, and that there was this bread that was there continually. And it was on this table that was made of wood, which was as we learned, it was made of shittim wood, which actually is flogging wood, which is fascinating. That wood, it isn't called by, oh, that's an oak or that's a maple. It's called based upon what its use was. And it was known as a wood to flog with. Amazing how all of these things point to Jesus, how you see these connections of the tabernacle and everything. The sum of the book, the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus and who he is prophetical and it was covered with gold and then on the left side or the south side you had this large menorah or golden candlestick and it had three um, branches on one side and three branches on the other and then in the middle you had the seventh branch and it, of course that speaks of Jesus as well in his humanity, but also his deity because of the six, but then the one in the center creating seven. So that's what you would see walking in. And we wouldn't see this, by the way. It was only the Levitical priesthood that would see this as they walked in. But they knew, even if they weren't Levites, they knew what was going on in there. And it would be discussed and talked about and so on. The writer of Hebrews, if it is Paul, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He's, he's not ministering in there. He's not, he doesn't have a place in there. It's only for the Levites. But the point, of course, is, is that they would walk in there, and to the right would be the candles. Sorry, to the uh, left would be the candlestick, and to the right would be the, the showbread or the table of showbread. And then, interestingly enough, it says, and after the second veil, because you had a first veil to get into this tabernacle, and then, which is, speaks of Jesus as well, because he says, I'm the door, I'm the way. And so it speaks in terms of him being the way into that holy place. And so you pass the first veil to get into the holy place, that 30 by 15 area, and then you have the holy of holies, which again, only the high priest would be able to go in there. And that would only be once a year. And interestingly, when you would enter in there, or if we entered in there, we would see what's called a golden censer, and then the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So, I'm grateful sometimes for things that are given to us through uh, the movies because we're able to see a little bit about what some of these instruments are. And of course, they're just artist representations. We don't really know. Now we're getting to a point where we're getting closer because when you begin to think about these things, specifically like the Ark of the Covenant, it's just a conjecture what it looks like in reality. But it's believed that the Jews know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant is. And that it is the same Ark of the Covenant that's always been the Ark of the Covenant that goes, spans 4,000 years ago. That it's still that same Ark of the Covenant. But that's not visible for us, but we do know some things about it. And this is where maybe Steven Spielberg helped us or didn't help us by... Uh, showing us what the Ark of the Covenant was and, you know, at least displaying a little bit related to the power 
that was behind it. And so the point being is that when you went into this holy of holies, you had an Ark of the Covenant, and upon the Ark of the Covenant, you had the mercy seat. All of this was, well, the Ark of the Covenant was made of wood, same type of flogging wood and covered with gold. And then the mercy seat was over the top of it and had these two angels on each side facing toward the middle. And again, this is the pattern of what God just showed or displayed to Moses. He showed, showed him the reality in heaven and now he's at a spot where he's seeing this and now he's thinking, okay, now God's telling me I need to build this ark or this box and it has a mercy seat on the top of it. Interesting though, because also, at least in this account, we see that the golden censer, or that golden altar of incense, which normally, if you have a Bible that has pictures, like the study Bible and shows the, the tabernacle, you'll find that altar of incense on the other side of the curtain meaning on the side of, you know, the holy place. But here, it seems to be on the other side, which is fascinating. It's never really totally defined in the Old Testament. And here we see the writer of Hebrews sort of implying that it's in there with the Ark of the Covenant. And then where is God? God dwells between the cherubim. So the high priest will go in once a year, first to make offering for himself, sacrifice for himself for his own sins and then another sacrifice would take place and then he would come back he would change his clothes wash and so on and then come back into the holy of holies with the sacrifice for the people and that covered that was the day of atonement for the nation of israel pretty awesome covered their sin the thing about all these offerings is that they were always intended to point to, I will provide myself the sacrifice, what Abraham said or received from the Lord when he saw that ram caught in the thicket and sacrificed that instead of Isaac. That every sacrifice was by faith looking forward to the one that would be given by the Savior. Hosanna, saved. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Lord, saved. It was always that idea or that doctrine that they were supposed to be mindful of. But what ended up happening was the Israelites, the Hebrews, they just sort of lost sight of it and kept it on the, on the horizontal. They sort of forgot that there was a Savior coming and that all of these sacrifices were about that one sacrifice that would be once and for all. They were caught up in all of these sacrifices. But they were still enough, if they were dutiful, if they were faithful, to complete those sacrifices. Every time there was a sin for the nation of Israel, that they had the Day of Atonement, that they did this, it was still covered. But there was a problem. Because about five years, maybe three years after the book of Hebrews was written, the temple was destroyed and sacrifices ceased. And now Israel or the Jews, they look at the day of atonement as a day of reflection. And so it's like, well, if I reflect over my life and it's kind of like uh, the idea, if I'm weighed in the balances that basically if I'm good, or if I'm gooder than badder, then I'm going to be okay. But see, this is a doctrine that they established. It's not one that God brought down. He said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So, as I alluded to last week, that God always makes a way for our sins to be atoned for. Unless you reject the avenue by which your <coughs> sins can be atoned for. And so what that means is that when the temple was destroyed, the Israelites or the Jews at that point, instead of embracing or recognizing that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, 
and understanding or being reconciled that all of their sins were once and for all reconciled through Jesus Christ. That instead of that, they rejected him. And for 2,000 years, they've been without redemption or without atonement upon their lives. And so as a result, the nation of Israel has 2,000 years worth of sin upon its shoulders. Those who have not received Jesus Christ. One day, it will happen though. The Lord will replace that heart of stone as we read in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, with a heart of flesh, like he's done with you and I. He'll write his law upon our hearts. And that law will not be the Ten Commandments, no gods before, no gods after, no uh, blasphemy of the, you know, of his name or, you know, taking it in vain. Won't have to do with the Sabbath. It won't have to do with honoring father and mother. It'll have to do with love, which far satisfies all the rest of those other things. If we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself. If we understand who he is and the fruit of the spirit, the love of God is happening because of our relationship. Remember, this was last week. He's invited you and I into a relationship that he has shared with the father. He invites you and I into that. And then in turn, we get to invite other people into it. And as we are fellowshipping in his love, in his presence, in who he is, looking at these things of the scripture and saying, God is so good. He's been so faithful when I was faithless that the fruit of the Spirit happens and now we want to invite other people. We want to stay there with Jesus and we want to invite other people to be with us because it's the awesome place to be. So, this golden censer, this Ark of the Covenant, this mercy seat are all in the Holy of Holies. And then within the Ark of the Covenant, there's a few things that are there. We see a golden pot of manna, which was the bread of life that had been given. You remember the thing that's fascinating about that is if you kept it an extra day, except for the Sabbath, what happened? It became wormy and gross and it spoiled. Except for the Sabbath, supernaturally, what would happen? It would last two days so that they would be able to eat on the Sabbath. They would take a double portion on Friday so that they would eat, have plenty to eat Friday morning. And then when uh, Saturday morning came, they weren't supposed to go out, but they, if they took enough the day before, that it would be sustained. But somehow, if you went out Sunday and tried to get a double portion and couldn't eat it, it would spoil. Miraculously, though, God said, I want you to take some of that manna and put it in the pot, and that's going to last forever in that pot. And I want you to put that inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And then in addition to that, we see that there's the tables or the tablets of the commandments, that there's the commands, the, you could say, man, they're commands, the bummer of the covenant, the downside of the covenant. Because God said, I'm going to be with you. You'll be more, my people. I'll be your God. I'll lead you into the promised land. And then he gives them the covenants. And then you could look at that and say, oh man, what a bummer. Or we could see that no, those commandments were the means of worshiping God. It was the definition of how to worship God. Which is kind of nice when we have a definition of how to worship God. Because otherwise, we would come up with all sorts of crazy things. We would say, well, if I worship God standing on one leg for four hours and praying, um, then God will be really happy with me. But he says, no, I, I don't want you defining it. You'll, you'll go crazy with this, and you'll come up with nutty things. And they do, and we do come up with nutty things. So he defined worship for them. For us, he defines our covenant that he's going to offer to them or has offered to them that they'll receive is to be saved by grace through faith. Love is what we have as a commandment. But they took these tablets of stone, put that in there with the pot of manna, and then took one other thing. Aaron, I won't get into all of the details about this, but Aaron, because of a rift that was taking place, saying, hey man, if 
what's the big deal about Aaron and the tribe of Levi? We're, we're okay. We're, we're related to Aaron. We're Levites too. Why doesn't God just work through us? So God said, okay, here's what I want you all to do. I want you all to take a staff specifically and bring it before me. And the short of it is that Aaron's budded with little almond buds and, and flowers and almonds on it. Which is interesting because that was just a dead piece of wood, wasn't it? It's a symbol of the resurrection. It's the symbol of taking something that's dead and that Aaron, remember, this was the same staff that Moses had, so it had been around for a while. It's a just a stick. No life in it. And now, life comes forward. So they took that, put it into the Ark of the Covenant. And that this would be something that would be in there. Who would see it? You would know about it by faith. Because the only ones that could ever see it would be maybe the high priest. It's not like you're going to parade this thing around. Even when they were moving the tabernacle uh, or marching around Jericho, they didn't pop it open and say, hey, look at the things that are inside here. It was by faith you knew what was inside. But within the Ark of the Covenant, underneath the mercy of God were the promises that God had done in the past so, so that we would know that there's future promises on top of the mercy seat. That was the foundation for it. But it was so that they would know that there's a better thing coming, which we'll come to that section here shortly. So it's a foreshadow of, of what God was going to be doing through them. And it's awesome. And it's just a tent, a little tent. Not like a pup tent, but I mean, 45 by 15. It's not that big for millions of people. And they came and offered sacrifices. And it tells us about the mercy seat that over it were cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. In other words, I'm not going to get into it that more, much more. Neither will I. But we could. There's a lot of cool things here. Now it goes on. And then it says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. So, as I mentioned, the showbread, they would go in on the Sabbath and change out the bread. More than likely, unleavened bread. Some people have said, oh, well, it's probably, you know, uh, leavened bread, or they may even reference that. I, I really don't think that in the holy place there's any sign of leaven, which is a symbol of sin. And then... They would take uh, oil and put that into the menorah, and they would also, they would do that daily or as often as it needed because they needed to keep that shining. So you have the bread of life on one side, and then on the other side you have the light of the world, the light. So again, both speaking symbolically or foreshadowing Jesus. And then you have the altar of incense. Which again, if that was on the other side of the curtain, maybe they were just taking this and kind of putting their hand in there and doing it. Because if they looked in there and it was not the Day of Atonement or if it was just one of the other priests who were on their um, rotation, then they would die having gone in there. But they would still minister. They would still make these offerings. So verse 6 now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But verse 7, into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So he had to be cleansed himself first. And then once he was cleansed and that was all taken care of, then he could go in and make atonement, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, once a year. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was yet standing. So again, the Holy Spirit is basically saying here, this is what the writer is emphasizing, that the way into the Holy of Holies wasn't completely known yet. So once, once a year, okay, that's good. Nation of Israel is saying, all right, we're okay with that. But there's something better. How about daily? How about today? How about right now access 
to the Holy of Holies. And so it goes on in verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. In other words, the high priest could go in there and he has sins and the nation of Israel has sins. They could go on in there and do this, these offerings, but then they could still walk away thinking, man, I'm glad my sin is atoned for, but I still know that I'm a sinner. I still know I'm a sinner. And that it's not really complete. It's not, it, it's taking care of, it's covering the stuff, but it's, you just, by faith, you can, you can know that it's taken care of, but you still know you're a sinner. Now, the cool thing about being born again is that having been born again, the old man dies with Christ at the cross. And the new man is resurrected with Jesus on the third day. So the sin that you and I are dealing with is dealt with once and for all. It's a done deal. And it stays upon Jesus Christ at the cross where he said it is finished and it's reconciled. And so we can know, we can have the conscience to know that not only is my sin atoned for, but it's done with. Taken care of. So, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. In the Reformation, we're not talking about Martin Luther here. We're talking about the Reformation that came with Jesus Christ going to the cross, laying down his life, and then resurrecting. Okay. So, picking up from there, verse 11, but Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. This is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So again, verse 11, Christ, high priest of what? This is good news. He's the high priest of good things to come. So all the things that we're looking at back here having to do with the, the tabernacle and the, the Ten Commandments and that old covenant, that's past and fading. Jesus Christ is the high priest of good things to come. You may be thinking, well, you know what, I'm not so happy with the things that are going on. It's okay. There's good things coming. There are good things coming. Jesus Christ is coming for his church. Jesus is returning again to Israel. He's setting up a millennial kingdom. These things are coming. Good things to come. And he's the high priest of it. It's a great verse. It's an awesome verse. Verse 11. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Something better than this tabernacle that they built 15 by 45. Better than that. But wait, there's more. And it goes on, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, but he's speaking of the heavenly building, the heavenly kingdom. And it's awesome. Okay, so we've got kids here. Maybe some of you are writing. Start drawing out what you know about the tabernacle. What have you learned so far about the tabernacle if you're taking notes like that? Adults, start drawing a picture of the tabernacle. What have you learned about it? And that this is a picture of Jesus Christ. Every one of those things is a picture of Jesus. Of better things to come. Better things to come. The heavenly tabernacle. The throne room. It's not the building that we're talking about that was built in the desert. We're talking about a building that was not made by hands. So, verse 12. Neither the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is what's crazy good about this, is that it says that we don't need the blood of the goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered into once. That he was without spot or blemish, but he entered into it once, once and for all, for all of us. He didn't need to die for himself. He didn't commit the sin. But... 
he became sin that we might have life. He, in a sense that that sin was placed upon him, upon his shoulders, and he bore it for us. So, not having to die, he did. And he entered once into where? The holy place, having eternal, obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit <clears throat> offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So let's back up. So stick with me here. Verse 13 says, if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer. So in order to deal with sin, you needed the blood of bulls or the blood of goats. So the bulls were upon the people for the sin offering, specifically the priesthood. But then the goats, you had one goat that you uh, offered. And then you had another goat that you placed the sins upon. And then some, one of the priests took them out to the furthest parts of the desert and set them loose as a symbol of, you know, our sins are separated far from us and it's lost. Get lost, sin. It's basically what it's about. So that's what we've heard the term scapegoat. That's what that is. So you had these two goats or the blood of bulls. Okay. So what about that? And then it goes on the ashes of a heifer. This is interesting because this came up a few years ago about, oh, they found a red heifer. They, the Jews, they found a red heifer. What's, what about the red heifer? And everyone's saying, wow, they found a red heifer. What's a red heifer and what, why is that important? Well, because if somebody was in, let's say, an area where there was another person that died, or if they touched that person, that had died. So let's say back in those days they were in a tent and somebody died in the tent. Then you were unclean for that period of time. And actually you continued to be unclean until you were ceremonially washed. And the way that you were ceremonially washed was that God prescribed that you're supposed to take a red heifer. So this is a female bovine cow whatever you want to call it, or a heifer, it's easier. And it was supposed to be red, red hair. The actual Hebrew word is the same word that we get for the ground, Adam, Adam. So the point being is that this heifer can't have any other hairs on it except for red hairs. No preference of L'Oreal. No hair coloring products of any kind. No Grecian formulas. I think that was the one in my day. So it had to just be a young female cow that had not worked, no work, and no, uh, all hairs red. So a few years ago, there were some that were born in Israel and there was the uproar. They were saying, oh, this is great because, well, you need to consecrate or purify the priests and the people just in general. Otherwise, they're, they're forever not pure or unclean. So you need to get that problem taken care of. So they were looking for a red heifer and they had two. But then here recently, they're about three years old. And now they, oh, man. This one has a white hair. Disqualified. Unless somehow it turns red before the time of its sacrifice would take place, which is, again, near Yom Kippur in the fall of this year. So the point is, is that they're looking at these cows. They're really concerned about these cows and the color of their hair and that they not be, that they not hurt themselves either because it, it's got to be, without spot or blemish. It means without spot means that there's no inherent problem, but without blemish means that, you know, they didn't scrape themselves up against a pole or something and, and cut themselves and now they've hurt themselves and now they're blemished. 
So Jesus was the, the male without spot or blemish. And this is what was required for the sacrifice. So again, coming back to this, we see that by, you know, we, we're looking at this section and it, it's saying there's something better on the, on the horizon. It's not about bulls. It's not about goats. It's not about heifers. It's, it's, it's not about any of that. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Then you remember where they were saying in verse 9, even though there was a sacrifice, it wasn't perfect because it didn't pertain to the conscience. Here we see verse 14, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is what's offered, a clear conscience. For what? To serve the living God. To serve the living God. So what would you rather have? Works, which is religion, trying to make our way to God through works, or just him doing the sacrifice and we have a clear conscience. And now we just serve him. Awesome. Much more straightforward. So what a contrast. And for this cause, he's a mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, which were under the first testament, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So in the King James specifically, it makes reference of a testament. And so it makes a delineation where Genesis through Malachi are the Old Testament. It speaks of the things of the old covenant, the old promise. And then the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, speaks of the new promise, speaks of Jesus Christ himself. So it goes on about this. It says, for where a testament is, in verse 16, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For the testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator lives. So... In other words, if, let's put it maybe in a different context, like a will or something. So if I have a will and I'm making it, I'm testifying to something in it, well, no one really gets access to that inheritance until I die, right? Unless I choose to do something with it, but really it's like, okay, we're all waiting for you to die so we can get on with the, the will. It's a similar idea here. That there's a testament, there's something that's been testified, but it can only come into work or it can only become activated through death. And so verse 18, well, verse 17, for the testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it has no strength. Wherefore, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, with scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and the people, and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So it's like there's a... There's a covenant, there's a testament, it's being established, but there's a shedding of blood in order to have that happen. So why is he emphasizing this? Why is the writer of Hebrews emphasizing it? Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all the things of the law purged with blood. Important verse, verse 22, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So these are all considered unsanctified until the blood is placed upon them. So it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So heaven's already purified. Heaven's already holy. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Into heaven itself. So I'm going to read the first couple verses out of John chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but it's important because 
as we see here in the beginning was the word some people say well there's genealogies and you know luke and matthew but john doesn't have one actually john does it's right here in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the same was in the beginning with god all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and darkness comprehended it not this is speaking of course of jesus but him becoming flesh and the reason why this is important is because jesus always had access to the holy of holies jesus was always available and there at the throne no problem but how do you get a man into that place and so the incarnation was that he became flesh he was perfect without spot or blemish and as a perfect man went to the cross laid down his life and atoned for you and I once and for all and makes intercession for us as not only God but also now as flesh or as man having resurrected he's in that spot to make that connection this is what it means when the writer earlier is saying let's move on to perfection let's move on to maturity let's move on to things that really matter let's move on to the better story let's move on to things that really matter to us goats bulls red heifers what the articles are made out of that's interesting but let's move on to better things and that is jesus christ who's not entered into the holy places with hands which are figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of god for us verse 25 nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others so it's saying here he, he doesn't need to enter or offer himself repeatedly if you're coming from a catholic background the mass says that jesus is re-offered that he goes through that redemption again with each mass but that's not true he did it once and for all so that's good news and then he goes on and he says for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world that he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself so this is why jesus came that he came he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son right this is it and then it goes on verse 27 and as it is appointed unto man once to die but after this the judgment okay once again if you're into yoga yoga is steeped in what reincarnation false false there is no reincarnation it's appointed for men once to die and then what the judgment yeah there's a couple examples where that didn't quite happen how about lazarus who was raised from the dead Bummer, that guy died twice. It's been said, though, he died twice, but he will not or doesn't suffer the second death. Kind of a trivial thing. What's the second death? The one where if you're outside of Jesus Christ, you're judged on the basis of your own works, on the basis of your reflections, of thinking that you're better. But we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God without the Savior we're done so it's appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment verse 28 so and this is our closing here so Christ once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation okay so a couple points here for Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many Jesus didn't bear the sins of all? 
Well, when he was at the cross, he atoned for all sin. He dealt with the matter of sin once and for all. But one way to think of this is that it applies to all, but not all will apply. Okay? It applies to all, but not all will apply. It's like being told, okay, we will put a million dollars into your account to bail you out of all of your credit card debt and have you pay off your house. I'm assuming no one here has over a million dollar house, so whatever. And we're going to do that, but you got to apply for it. You got to just sign up and say, okay, that's a great invitation, but you got to show up and say, I'm in. And then it happens. The redemption that Jesus Christ offers is for the whole world. God's not willing that any would perish, but all come to repentance. And yet, it's those who trust him by faith, the whosoever will believe wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life in John 3.16. And to throw a wrench into the deal, then you have the issues of election and stuff like that which like I can't figure that one out I can't either I know that election is in the Bible and that it's true it's biblical and I also know that we're supposed to choose you this day whom you will serve but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord you got a choice so let's not worry about the election issue let's be more concerned about just affirming and applying and saying, I'm all in with you, Jesus. I want to follow you. And I want to keep following you. As I mentioned before, what did Paul say? Fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. You got to stay in the race and then you got to finish it. You're in a fight, you can't just back out. You got to go to the end. And so... With that, unto them, this is who it applies to, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Sort of telling us we need to be looking for Jesus. That we have an attitude that isn't just like, oh man, I'm looking at my bills. I'm looking at my car broken down on the side of the road with one tire off. I'm looking at all these other things. No, we need to be looking for Jesus. Yes, these are matters that we need to attend to. I'm looking at not having set up retirement, looking at kids' college funds. No, look unto Jesus. And for those that are looking for him, it says he'll appear, which is kind of interesting. I don't know that that's just talking about the end of the trib or the rapture. I think that if we're looking for Jesus, we'll find him. If you sanctify your life over to the Lord, the Lord will speak to you and you'll hear him. He will minister to you through the word of God. And he will give you bread today because he promises it. He'll take care of what the, your situations are. He'll be with you through those. So, Unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time. What's it say later on in Hebrews? It's actually one of our scripture verses. It's at the bottom of your bulletin. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is what we're talking about in verse 11, where it says, good things to come. Good things to come. So, take heart. There's good things to come. One of them is that we have lunch in just a minute. And we'll be able to fellowship with one another. Good things to come. And good things will continue to come. This isn't just a prosperity message. I'm not emphasizing that. But I'm saying that if you're looking to Jesus, that he will show you those things through which or by which you can rejoice in him. And he's blessed us and will continue to bless because we're his children. We're saved by his grace. And part of that grace is that he wants to bestow gifts upon you and I. Why? For our own doing? Well, actually, he gives us gifts so that we can give them away. 
Each one should use whatever gift they've received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. 1 Peter 4.10 So we bless you today, Lord. We thank you that there are good things, and we want to look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. You started it, and we trust that you're with us through the whole process of our lives, that whole progress that we would have and that you're there at the end. And we pray that you would be glorified as we abide in you and as we just trust you and, and look to you, that you would be glorified and that we in turn would encourage others to say, look up, be watchful, for our redemption drives, draws near, that you're coming for us, but that you're with us now too. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen.